Okay. Got it. So as I mentioned, uh, there are many um, global modes. These are dubs tearing modes, m equal one and m equal zero modes uh, affecting the dynamics uh, of the RFP. And we have seen that it changes its topology, it changes its uh, transport properties uh, in uh, uh, nonlinear ways. But there are other modes uh, which were uh, already identified very early, but um, um, basically put aside saying that we will think about these modes later on in uh, in their research and these are non-resonant modes and we conventionally call them as a non-resonantly non non um, non-resonant internally or non-resonant externally and which these are called resistive wall modes and i will show you in a minute uh, how they are called uh, how they are derived basically and um Today, I'm going to, to, to show how with these active coils, we will control both of them. So now let me start with the resistive wall mode, which basically are described in the realm of linear MHD. This is the realm of engineers, actually. So they use all of their machinery uh, that allows to deal with a lot of uh, intricate details and uh, about the power supplies, <coughs> but um, Basically, they are linear, and so this simplifies a lot of things. And then we start with a recall of the RFP ideal stability and the first evidences. And now, basically, ideal MHD stability of RFPs is hidden in very old papers, very difficult to read, actually, so full of analytics. But Friedberg, in his late last version of the, the his ideal MHD book actually summarized it with some simplifications, but to make it understandable. And so in, 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 in summary, <coughs> the, the, the stability of ideal MHD modes in, with a given RFP configuration can be summarized in a theta beta uh, diagram. So it, it, uh, clearly the reversal is necessary as we have seen in the first day. So if the Q has a minimum, then there are some resistive interchanges. So the F parameters need to be less than zero, which is the ratio between the edge to the field and the flux produced by the, by the plasma. Then internal pressure driven modes are stable below a very high beta, which is uh, here basically. And then next are the localized interchange pressure driven M equal one modes, which are stable below this kind of threshold here, which is still very high in beta. It depends on the equilibrium. So for a given theta, where this is the, the, the F equal zero and F equal one lines determine the region in which the RFP typically operate. And another characteristic is that the core pressure in order to this mode to be um, stable, it must be flat. And experimentally, actually, either in the shock states or in the multiple state in the center, the pressure and the temperature are always flat, actually. And the internal M equal one modes have the same stability boundary as Sweden. So both Sweden and Newcomb criterion basically give the same, the, the same uh, threshold. And so at the beginning, it was thought that RFP was promising very high beta operation because there is no stability idea, stability limit for, for, for the RFP differently from Tokamak. And all of this, uh, all of this uh, stability is for with so-called internal mode, meaning that they do not displace the last closed surface. So the plasma remains exactly uh, cylindrical in this case. And if, uh, um, if a, a conducting shell is located just in front of the plasma, that's it. So this is all the ideal stability that it is required for an RFP. But as practically, you cannot place a, a, a conductor just in front of a, of, a, of, a, of a plasma. And if there is some vacuum between the plasma and this conductor, there is another kind of, of modes, which are so-called the external modes which can be unstable. And here now it is uh, uh, le less, um, less optimistic, let's put it this way. So without a wall, there always exists some M equal one external modes, even at zero pressure. So they are current driven, no pressure driven, 
but are always unstable. And here is an example of how it is determined. So by doing some marginal stability analysis, so computing the variation of energy for a given uh, <coughs> the displacement in the linear eigenfunctions. And it turns out that this is a spectrum here shown, but for a certain equilibrium, either with beta equals zero or beta equals zero one, there is a number of modes here uh, around n equals zero which are delta v w negative means that they are unstable. So they can grow unstable no matter how low is beta. And the only way you can stabilize this mode is to make a conducting wall sufficiently near. By sufficient means that even if it is three times the plasma, so kind of far away, some of the modes can get positive two times 1.7. So in principle, if it is sufficiently near, but not that much, you can obtain delta w positive for all of them so for a given equilibrium now you have to to check all possible equilibrium and it turns out that clearly you get the um, the, the one which grows fastest and you, you change the various theta possibilities and you will see that you will get that at least 1.4 is the aspect ratio which is still good actually you, you can do um a, a, a reactor with a, with a conducting wall of 40% far away from the plasma. So you can in place inside all the machinery you, you need, actually. So this, in principle, is something that is, uh, can be dealt with uh, in, in dealing with a reactor or, or a device. And, and so this is the main, main difference. So the, the pinch, the RFP, requires for the ideal stability the presence of a, of a conducting wall. And... Um, but there is another problem, is that any conducting wall uh, is not infinitely conducting. So in, uh, in time, decay, uh, the, the eddy currents will decay. The time it takes for this eddy current to decay is uh, related to the um, thickness of the wall and its resistivity. So the, the thicker the wall, <clears throat> the longer the time it takes for the eddy currents to decay and uh, um, consistently, this, 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 this eddy currents that keep the plasma from basically uh, de deforming itself. And in fact, uh, given this thickness, the thick shell experiments were the ones in which uh, the discharge duration was uh, shorter than the shell time. So uh, a way to circumvent this problem was just uh, to look at the plasma uh, for, uh, for a time, time window below the time it requires for this instability to grow. Why? In the thin shell RFPs, as now it is in RFX mod, the discharge length is comparable or longer than the wall time. Now, <clears throat> these uh, ideal modes, whenever you have a resistive shell, get the, the, be, begin uh, to, to be uh, resistive wall modes. They, they are called this way. So they do not grow on the ideal time scale of a of the uh, microseconds, so of the half van square, uh, thin ways, but uh, they grow much more slowly. But at that time in which they were identified, they were considered as a serious problem for the RFP as a, as a fusion concept. This is an example of uh, a spectrum. This is a high aspect ratio machine. So the higher the aspect ratio, the wider the spectrum of all possible modes that can be unstable. So, uh, as I said, uh, most of the RFPs avoided RWM with thick shells, while uh, several others uh, investigated RWM physics just to verify whether uh, uh, linear theory were ap applicable in, uh, to, to real plasmas. And the first experiments that performed a convincing experiment showing these RWM instabilities was the HBTX1C, so one of the first generation in the last uh, in the last modification of the experiment, in which, uh, <clears throat> in a few millisecond time scale, uh, clear exponential growth of many modes that were were observed, and it would corresponded to three times uh, scales, uh, so, so three times the, the, the wall time, which was one millisecond. So the time traces are shown here, and 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 in that experiment, they also tried. To, uh, to feedback stabilize, because in principle, the idea is that uh, if you have these eddy currents into the shell, which are decaying, you can think to use some coils outside the shell that provide the current in the time scale it, it decays, so that you continuously feed these eddy currents inside, inside the shell. 
And why it is possible actually depends on the fact that the theory is linear. And so you can uh, you can imagine that uh, your uh, your coils that you are winding around the, your the, the plasma basically generate a, a single Fourier harmonic. <clears throat> so you have a, a sheet of current of n equal one or generic n, which is located uh, in, a, in a particular radius outside the plasma, and this eddy eddy coil sustain the eddy currents. Now, the derivation is uh, algebraic, it's kind of lengthy, but uh, it can be seen that the helical coils and the conducting shell act as a boundary condition for the uh, Newcomb's equation uh, stability um, um, method to determine linear stability. So you can de determine how the eigenfunction is varied by the presence of these two um, boundary conditions the shell actually has some current which is induced due to the fact that the, the, the mode changes so it induces some current while the coils changing the, the boundary condition due depending on the current which is flowing so the helical current which is flowing the evolution is simple one one degree uh, ordinary the, the ordinary derivative equation and ODE which we have a component in which you have the, the growth rate of, uh, of the mode and the, con the contribution of the, of, the, of the coil here. And so it is what is this called from the engineers a uh, one pole model. So a very simple model, so an exponential growth. The, 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 same, <coughs> the, the, the same framework without plasma can give you simply the penetration of a of an harmonic. Now, what the control variable here is the radial field uh, at, the, at the radius of the shells and, and on the coils. So pretty simple. So once you have your system, which is the, um, uh, described by a uh, linear growth uh, as in the simplest case that I have shown, in control theory terms, uh, you have given the open loop behavior of your system, which is the process plant. So uh, you have your output preference. You want your actuator, which are the coils, to produce some current. And then and your, your uh, RWM evolution equation gives you how the, the plant will process this current. And it will tell you which is the, the current, which is the amplitude of the radial field due to the mode. In closed loop, this reference actually is determined by a controller, which is based on a sensor, which measures the output, so the radial field in this case, and it compares on to, to the wishes of the experimenter, so basically having a zero value or a finite value, so some kind of reference, and then the controller uh, have to decide which action, so which reference to go to the, to the coils, so they're very simple actually. So in the system, in the simplest system in which we have a one pole unstable system and uh, uh, the, the simplest idea that you can implement is that uh, the, the far away you are from the reference, the, the, the more you want to push just to get near to, the, to, to your desired reference. So it is a proportional control and you, you can simply work it out uh, in, in equations here. <coughs> You can also try to, to, to give a finite reference as we did in the past, but no, we are not discarding for simplicity. And the evolution of a plant in this case is very simply dictated by an exponential. So if your grow, oh, oh sorry. If uh, the gain is zero, then you have gamma, which is an exponential. So the, the solution is exponentially um, increasing. Uh, if you increase your gain, the exponential will decrease. At a certain time, you, you get to the marginal stability, and then you will stabilize the system. And your steady state behavior will uh, be either with a reference value or with zero, if uh, you have not set any, any different value. Clearly, this is the simplest, uh, um, the simplest model that you can use, and it always converge. If you have delays or if you have some non-ideal behavior or some components, uh, it may be impossible to obtain a negative exponential, but we are sk skipping this part now. Now, what they did in HBTX was actually really to implement this kind of, uh, of, of control. So, we have to have a sensor, we have to have an actuator. So the sensors were <clears throat> uh, analog constructed series and anti-series of pickup coils uh, taken on, on a quarter 
of a machine. And in fact, they were targeting M equal two, M equal one, N equal two, so which has some kind of symmetry. And so we were able to, to obtain either the cosine and the sine component and feeding two sets of coils, uh, allowing to, to produce both the sine and the cosine component of a mode. And they were using analog feedback. So basically, this is was this was really the realm of engineers and not physicists, uh, because uh, every tool was analog. And they were successful in this respect. So they were able to publish a paper in which they showed that the two, the two components, the cosine, the cosine component of the two one mode, actually we were kept uh, at a low level in the milliseconds range. It was six milliseconds, but. Uh, as they were targeting only one mode, and there were 10 of them, uh, the overall discharge performances were not uh, improved. And uh, the proof was that it can be controlled in feedback. So that was a, a, a good news. The bad news was that it was practically very difficult to implement uh, different coils with different helicities for different modes, which may change. And so having all of it and so on and so forth. So. Uh, as Freiberg says in his, in his book, uh, it was known that in theory it could be done, but in practice, very lot, a, lot, a lot of people were skeptical about the possibility of doing this kind of stabilization. So there were smarter idea around, but still it required some uh, technological development. And this is the intelligent shell concept. So. <clears throat> uh, Lozon in 77, but later on also Bishop proposed a different scheme. So instead of having helical coils dedicated to doing helical harmonics, targeting each mode, okay, forget about the mode. <coughs> Imagine that you want to, you, you see the shell, you see the shell, but it is actually um, uh, frozen the flux. So what the shell does is no matter what mode you have, whenever the mode is penetrating, an eddy current is trying to cancel it. And so um, imagine that you have so a saddle loop, which is delivering the right amount of, of, of radial field that you require. Bishop's idea is do, okay, let's do it in feedback. So connect a fee, uh, the saddle loop, which is producing the coil, the saddle coil, which is producing the field, with a flux loop which measure it. And so basically the idea is no matter what mode the system is generating, take the signal of a loop and uh, feed it in feedback to the, to the, uh, the coil loop and make it to make it zero, basically. So the idea, no matter what mode will be there, you will be have a, a zero, zero, uh, zero flux. So an, an intelligent shell in itself. Clearly, there are some limitations because the, the, the shell is can be thought as being produced, the real shell, the, the continuum shell, by an infinite number of coils, which is not something that you can do with the real coils that you are winding. And so uh, you have to limit to a discrete number of, of coils. But how many of them do you need do you require? Well, at the very least, you need to have twice than the minimum and the maximum because you need, you need to deliver the radial field uh, with with a, with a topology which is similar to the sinusoid, but you are uh, but you are um, willing to, to to cancel basically. So at least uh, uh, for an m equal one, you need uh, uh, at least three coils in the poloidal direction, so that you can be sure that you can control all of the all of the phases that the mode can can grow. But from practical reason, it is basically taking from four. But the point is, whenever you go in instead to <coughs> um, many modes, the criteria uh, get more complex. And here comes in, in, into play the, the concept of sideband harmonics, because the fact that these subtle coils do not produce a continuum field, but it is kind of squarish. So in, uh, in Fourier terms, it is full of uh, sideband harmonics instead of uh, together with the dominant one. And so let's visualize. So there are people who prefer to see formulas. So I prefer to see pictures just to give an impression of what a, a sideband is. And so this is a cartoon showing what does a system, a control system, uh, how it behaves whenever he wants to fight again a, a radial field, which is located in the, in the last closed surface. So this is a one seven mode, say one, 
one particular helicity in which the color encodes the radial field. So it is nicely sinusoidal. But then uh, it is picked up by uh, our control system. And then the control coils, which are discrete, are trying to, to, to zero the, the flux, uh, which is below each and every uh, control coil. And uh, the, the field uh, broadly resembles the n equal one, n equal seven, but it is kind of some of squarish, as you see in the picture, because it is uh, rich of what it, uh, I call the sidebands. So many multiples of a dominant frequency, which is being generated here, so seven, so in both in the M direction and the N, N direction, and the multiples is the number of coils. So basically, so the, the first uh, for the seven uh, in the phase of 48, it is the 55 and so on and so forth. Um, so the point is whenever you have a spectrum of harmonics, uh, if your system is trying to cancel harmonics, say minus 11, you have to have enough toroidal coils so that the first harmonic, which is after NC, should not be in the unstable part of the spectrum. Otherwise, it will couple these two modes through the, through the, 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 the sideband. And this actually was actually done whenever in we were in in XRT2, the small machine in which uh, the controller was developed before RFX mod was actually operating. So during the installation, the commissioning, and as uh, we you, we did not have all of the audio amps that were required. Actually, this is a small machine, so the amplifiers that were were feeding the power supply units that were feeding the power the cover the coils were actually audio amps are used for concerts say so they were suitably modified in order to have low frequencies but that's it so it was a very standard technology and having half of them available we already tried the experiment and it turned out that uh, it, it visualizes what means that you are coupling two modes basically so below the, the, the control coils the zero the mode uh, the measurement was zero but the two modes combined together so that they were non-zero only in the region where without coils, basically. And so this is the coupling visualized, say. Once uh, we had uh, all of the amplifiers uh, in place uh, and uh, the system worked, actually, both in uh, XRT2R and in RFX mode, it was possible basically to uh, um, routinely uh, remove and stabilize the RWM for in the case of extra t 2 which is a small machine, high aspect ratio, the, the increase was also more dramatic because it also canceled a lot of error fields which were present in the machine. Well, in RFX still it was good and actually it allowed also going to two megaamps. So this is the first part on the resistive wall modes. Now I'm skipping a lot of details. Now I'm gi giving for granted that they behave linearly, but the people was skeptical about that because actually it is true that whenever you pick one mode, it behaves linearly, but whenever it is inserted in an RFP, which is full of nonlinear mm, uh, interacting resistive um, tearing modes, uh, uh, there was some skepticism about the fact that they would continue to behave linearly also when in, in other phases. But it turned out that we have plenty of experimental evidences that they still are in the real domain, so they can be dealt with control theory and the control technology. Different story is the control of tearing modes because they are nonlinear. I just gave you some example at the very beginning in the first lessons of the fact they are wall locked. And all of this kind of behavior, or also the dynamic relaxation events, they are all non-linear. They cannot be dealt with the linear tool theory, but they still respond to what you do from the outside with, uh, with, with your control coils. The point is that the modeling requires some kind of non-linear non uh, ad hoc modeling, which cannot also rely on the standard control tool technologies. Either. Yes. It's quite possible that many of the people in the field don't quite know what the tearing means. They don't even come from. Unfortunately, because actually, the these are what I called global modes in the first lessons. So I, I only showed that these global modes basically I have to uh, resort to the first session. First, uh, let me.
Yes, I sw swifted to jargon actually. So in the first two versions, I was uh, uh, was careful in not using jargon. So I was calling them just like uh, global modes, and then. Because we, we terrain modes are characterized by the fact that they do have a resonance surface, they are, do have islands, but uh, they also deform the last close flux surface. And so, uh, as I said, they are, to be precise, resistive king terrain modes because they do islands and they displace uh, also the, uh, the edge and they produce this kind of, uh, of, of behavior, basically. And with a control coil, so in a sense, they behave like resistive wall modes in the sense that they are deforming the last closed surface, surface. but uh, they do have, differently from a resistive wall mode, um, uh, a resonance surface with some current flowing into it. So it is a, a more degree of freedom and if they interact with each one with each other. And it is doing a different, um, they, they, they can rotate. And so uh, this is why I, um, they are tougher to control, let's say. Okay. So without control, uh, in um, without control, these steady modes are observed to, to rotate spontaneously. So uh, at frequency in the kilohertz range. Uh, but they tend to wall lock um, in conditions which were actually widely different from experiment to experiment at the beginning. And an example here is from the MST, uh, in which actually the second trace is the velocity, the magnetic phase velocity, and also the velocity of the plasma as measured with uh, spectroscopy, so Doppler shift basically, and so they go together. But whenever this mode grows compared to the other, and it goes to a single helicity as I showed in the first day, so its amplitude increases at a certain point, it eventually, the, the, the rotation frequency locks, so it goes to zero, and also the plasma is arrested. And this is occurring more or less around 200, 300 kiloamps or even 400 in, in different uh, regimes. While in RFX, we never saw a rotation in RFX. I was a student, I was working on the soft X-ray tomography. I uh, prepared a lot of correlation analysis technique and trying to look at the correlation in frequencies between the various signals and during my PhD thesis and nothing was there. It was a desperation. And we only were able to find rotations in RFX mode whenever we did um, experiment at very low current to, compared to what was actually the, the, the design. So we were able to push our power supply to, on the low side. So at, in, in the 100 kiloamp range, actually some rotation as seen here, both in the flow of plasma and in wavelets of internal measurements were, were occurring. So the threshold for wall locking in RFX was incredibly low compared to MST. And it comes that uh, this wall locking phenomenon is a nonlinear phenomenon, which is due to the eddy currents in the, it was thought it was in the shell, MST and RFX had aluminum shell, both. But it turned out that it is the first conducting, the first conducting structure around the plasma that matters. And depending on the resistivity of this structure, uh, there is much more or less breaking torque. And such a breaking torque um, uh, is, is a balance between uh, the drag by the plasma and the electromagnetic torque. And so it depends on the mode amplitude, on the resistivity of the shell, and also on the, on the, on the gas. So in deuterium and in hydrogen, uh, the torque behaves differently due to the fact that the viscosity is different it is due to the transport coefficient. And as I said uh, the first day, this is a way by which we can estimate viscosity basic by, by, by measuring the braking whenever we apply some error fields. And so Fitzpatrick did the phenomenological braking torque model, which is written here, but it is full of awkward amount of analytical formulas with a non-linear, uh, quasi-linear approach. But it turned out that uh, he was able to explain the fact that RFX and MST were very different due to the fact that RFX had an inconel vessel. 
This inconel vessel was actually designed in order to be nuclear. Uh, it's uh, even more robust than stainless steel. Uh, it was uh, designed uh, to be light. And uh, so it had a nice, uh, a lot of nice engineering properties, but this resistivity actually was uh, un underestimated. Actually, they were thinking that being the more resistive, the more similar to vacuum and so that's it. So forget it about it. But it turned out that actually it determined the, 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 the very low wall locking threshold. Actually, in RFX module, we, we are getting rid of, of this, this shell. So uh, how did we try to active control to mitigate, uh, to mitigate this wall locking in RFX, in RFX mod? Basically, uh, to remind, in RFX, from the beginning of the discharge, the deformation due to the wall locking was uh, always in the same place, changing from, from shot to shot here as a function of the toroidal uh, position in time, the deformation the VR is always the same. And then we switched on the, the coils, the 48 times uh, four uh, control coils uh, in virtual shell, we, we call it virtual shell, but we, in the intelligent shell approach, actually, this measurement, the, the, the fluxes were basically zero. And so they were happy. So we, we, did, we, we, we removed the, the, the wall locking, but still uh, cameras and, and, um, and influxes were showing some clearly nice signature of the interaction. So something was not going, going well. So it turned out that uh, these measurements were polluted by still again, the sidebands, as I showed you in the, in the RWN session, but uh, these sidebands were polluting the measurements. So they were affecting the control in a more subtle way. So at first uh, you have to remove the aliasing and we'll show you why it is. And it turned out that the intelligent shell was doing good, but not that good. So it, there was a residual, a, re, a residual uh, uh, radial field deformation that was pro pro causing a localized wall interaction. And the idea was the fact that uh, you have the same number of actuators as the same number of sensors. So Bishop's idea was very nice. So you have your coil, you, you want to zero the, free, the, the flux by applying exactly the same amount of flux. So you measure all zero and you are happy. But whenever you are harmonics, uh, this zero is, uh, is actually done by the, the harmonic itself. And all of the other sidebands there, so they all pile up. So your measurement uh, is this one. So part of it is real harmonic, part of it is uh, actually different harmonic. So your zero is not a good zero put in this way. The real solution would be just to increase the number of cells. So get rid of, of this intrinsic limitation of the intelligent shell approach and use uh, much more sensors, or as it was impossible in RFX, compute it in real time, basically. This is a visualization of what the spectrum was. So the control system uh, without any correction was thinking that basically the red curves were zero. So, and uh, all of the, the diagrams that I have shown were basically with, this, with these measurements. But whenever you, you, you remove we you the alias, the measurement, the real spectrum was here. So there was a residual significant one. And so we had to correct it. And okay, long story short, when we corrected this kind of, uh, of a systematic error, error, basically switching from the intelligent shell control to the mode control. So changing the gains in a different space, doesn't matter the details. It turned out that the, the deformation was reduced, but to a level because it began to jump. And so we experienced for the first time since I was waiting, since I was PhD, some, some, I had some rotation. It was in the Hertz range, tens of Hertz range instead of kilohertz, but some rotation was, was there. And given that we implemented in 2007 this, uh, this new control, it was possible to reach the two mega amps, which was impossible basically due to the locked mode uh, that we had and reach the highest temperature in, uh, in RFX. And now we also realized that still there are some limitations in this kind of control. And this, we, 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 we had to model this, uh, the, the, the control by ex expanding the 
uh, old Fitzpatrick theory of uh, the passive, um, um, we say the effect of a passive boundary on the wall locking. And so by enhancing this, uh, this approach uh, using the quasi-linear uh, um, Fitzpatrick approach. And so this is the modeling of the, of the eigenfunction of a given mode. For example, it is a one seven. So the, uh, it is not a full code. This means that uh, the radial field at the resonance is an input to a system. But uh, this code tells you how it rotates the subject to the fact that you have a vacuum vessel, you have a boundary, you have a, you have a coils. So given a complex structure of, uh, of, of boundary conditions, it can give you, which is the minimum value of the radial field at the edge that you can obtain. And taking into account that uh, if you implement some kind of algorithms, it will begin rotating more or less. Uh, and it will also interact with other modes. Now, our figure, the parameter of merit is this uh, value at the edge. The lower this value, the lower the interaction. And it turned out that uh, uh, the model explained what we were seeing experimentally. So uh, by increasing the gain of a various mode, we were able to reduce the radial field at the edge. We reduce, we reduce it, so we do a gain scan. But at a certain point, actually, uh, the reduction doesn't proceed. But uh, what happens is that the plasma begins to rotate. So you try to fight against the plasma, and then it, uh, it switches it, put its position. And the faster you push, the faster it goes, uh, it, it escapes from you. And, um, and this depends on the passive structures that you have uh, in the system and also on the, uh, the real system. So in the feedback delays, the discretization, and so on and so forth. And so there is a limitation. So we are stuck with a certain limit. We cannot do better than an ideal shell with uh, the control coils, even if that was expected and hoped, basically. It turned out that the vacuum vessel still was playing another bad role, say. And so uh, this minimum as a function, the minimum as a function of the gain uh, was limited. But uh, by replacing the vessel and making the plasma nearer to the copper shell, it allowed us, in principle, to, in, in theory, in the model, to decrease by a factor of two, the minimum value. And so this was a further motivation to motivate, to, to, to change from RFX mode to RFX mode two and to get rid of, of the inconel vessel, basically. And so, and, and the last part of my, 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 my presentation, RFX mode was uh, uh, designed in this way. So it had the mechanical structure, the passive stabilizing shell, and then the vacuum vessel and the graphite. So the distance between the shell and the plasma was this way. So 1.11, uh, 1 something like that. In RFX mode 2, which, which is now being built and assembled, the plasma actually is uh, touching ties, and the ties are attached directly to the copper shell. So which is here. So uh, the plasma is bigger by a few centimeters. And so the, the ratio between the distance of the shell of the plasma is 1.04. And so we expect uh, an improvement. And actually, the first improvement by using the code, uh, the RFX locking code, is that the, the amplitude of the radial field at the edge we should be, in principle, decreased by a factor of three. Clearly, the code takes the input, uh, the value of the resonant modes at the resonant surface as given. So uh, we, we pessimistically assume that they are not decreasing. Also, the, the simulation can be run in order to see which is the value at which uh, uh, wall locking will occur. And while in Inconel, uh, this is actually a very synthetic uh, uh, run in which uh, modes are supposed to grow linearly and the plasma is a, the plasma rotation is measured here and with Inconel actually whenever the modes uh, get to a level which is consistent with 100 kiloamps they lock while in copper it is expected that such a threshold would be much higher clearly this is optimistic we will see uh, in the real experiment so we, we should have a possibility to to uh, have uh, some experimental regimes with rotating modes, just like in MST. And finally, not relying only on the, um, this uh, semi-empirical, semi-phenomenological mode uh, 
in which the Terry modes amplitude were taken as given. Some runs with uh, viscoresistive uh, special code were done uh, at uh, Lundquist number 10 to the 5 with some resistive uh, um, shell con, uh, boundary conditions, so with some vacuum. And so they simulated, uh, say, an ideal feedback by changing the, the, the location of the ideal shell. And uh, by performing runs at different uh, wall proximities, in particular going from RFX mod to RFX mod 2, both the edge value, which is the black line, clearly is decreased. Now in the code, uh, uh, whenever the, the, the wall uh, touches the plasma, it is zero. But also the average um, energy of the modes decreases by, say, a 25%. And so assuming very simple resistive stochastic transport confinement, which we know which is not correct, uh, and knowing that uh, this is for MH regime, which we know we hope to go to do better, but would correspond to a 40% increase of confinement. And so uh, we should see something different in RFX mod 2. And so in summary, I, I quickly showed you that uh, in RFX mod uh, with uh, the active control coil, we were able to either solve the problem of resistive wall mode, or that was thought as technologically impossible by many people in uh, in the 70s and the 80s, and this is can taken as for granted. While for telling modes, uh, we succeeded in getting to the two megaamps. We succeeded in uh, mitigating the issue of the wall mode. We identified some limits, and with RFX mode two, we are going to hopefully restart operations and investigate VRFP further. That's it. Thank you.